Have you ever tried scrolling online looking for advice on the best running technique? It's pretty frustrating, isn't it? Mainly because there are so many contradictions. I'm just looking online now and I can see one blog that says that heel striking is bad and another saying that heel striking is completely fine. I have some websites that are promoting barefoot shoes and I have some other websites that are promoting like maximalist cushioning stability shoes. And I found a lot of running posts saying that all runners should run with a cadence of 180, but I can't find a shred of evidence backing this up. So let's put two heavy hitters into a five round battle. In the red corner, we have running technique advice found on blogs, posts, and like running websites. And in the blue corner, we have actual running research. And after these two hash things out, you'll be left with two simple running elements that you need to focus on. That's it, only two things. So you can scrap all the other confusing misinformation, information, and get back to running with confidence. Okay, round one, we have our two contenders and is about avoiding the heel striking. This advice is in almost every single blog that I read. And they say that heel striking creates greater breaking forces, which will lead to injury and poor performance. But representing team research is Peter Larson, who shows that heel striking is actually extremely common and is present in 89% of marathon runners, regardless of their ability, meaning that even the elites, they still heel strike and it doesn't affect marathon completion time. When it comes to injury, we also have research that also fails to find high quality evidence to prove this hypothesis. So in other words, research is yet to find compelling evidence to prove that heel striking is actually harmful. More on that later, but let's get into round two. Team blog says you should reduce the inward rolling of your foot and ankle, commonly known as pronation, especially for those who have flat feet. Well, Q Rasmus Nielsen, who I've actually mentioned in previous videos, who clearly explains that pronators get injured less than those who have a neutral foot shape. Essentially, this is because the movement of pronation is actually a protective mechanism and actually helps decelerate the ground reaction force when we impact the ground. Just keep in mind that if you pronate more than others, or if you have flat feet, your body has adapted to this throughout your entire life and will be used to it. And therefore it is safe to do. Just make sure that your training loads are within acceptable limits. And you make sure that when you progress that training, you do so gradually. The next two rounds as we continue battling this out revolves around a higher risk of injury if you have a leg length discrepancy or if your glutes aren't switching on. How many of you runners have had an injury and been told this? Been told that you either have a leg length discrepancy or your glutes aren't switching on? You're not alone. For the leg length discrepancy round, fighting against team blog, we have Gary Nutson. And Gary reveals that 90% of the population actually have some degree of leg length discrepancy. The average is about five mil. So essentially, if you go looking for a leg length discrepancy, odds are you're probably gonna find it. But for a leg length discrepancy to start disrupting your running mechanics, you need to have a difference of 20 mil, which is present in about one in every 1000 people. Moving on to round four is all about your glutes not switching on. This one is like extremely frustrating. It really gets me worked up and look, it probably doesn't deserve much airtime. What you can do, stand on one leg. Next, you can hop on that leg. And if you aren't falling over and collapsing to the ground, congratulations, your glutes, they're switching on. Okay, into our final round, which for team blog is the advice that you should run with a 180 cadence. And on team research, we have no one. And this is because this is a myth with no science actually backed up whatsoever. This magic number actually emerged not through science, but through one running coach observing his elite athletes and just calculating their average steps per minute. But to find out exactly what is cadence and what cadence you should strive for, keep watching. I don't know about you, I'll let you decide, but I think team research wins this fight. So it's time for team research to celebrate. They're gonna do their victory lap. And while they're doing that victory lap, let's dive into the parts of a running technique that are actually important. And remember, I said this at the end, this is all gonna boil down into two areas of focus. So it's gonna be super simplistic, but keep watching. 
The first big one that is important is an overstride. If you have an overstride, it is essentially making your initial contact with the ground too far in front of your body. If that's present, you need to correct it. In fact, research by Chris Brammer found reaching out in front of your body with a straighter knee and with your toes pointing upwards actually increases your risk of injury. So contacting with the heel is still safe. Keep that in mind, but you need to contact with the heel more underneath your body. Chris Brammer also found a link with injury and a forward trunk lean, which is our second running technique element that is important. So just try not to bend forward at the hips and instead try and keep an upright chest. Research also found that a higher ground reaction force may be linked to certain injuries such as stress fractures. And this is our third element to focus on. These types of runners essentially just hit the ground harder. They make a louder noise and slap the ground. And there was another paper that found a 62% decrease in injury rates when runners retrained themselves to run quieter and land softer. This next running element I'm gonna talk about, it's strange, I find it surprising. No one else talks about it. You can't really find it anywhere. And is talking about your step width. This refers to the position of the foot in relation to the midline. You can have a wide step width, a narrow step width, or even a crossover step width. A crossover pattern can generate unnecessary strain on the inside of your ankle, the shin, the outside of your hip. And we even have research to show that the more narrow your step width, the higher strain on your ITB. So if you've had injuries in these areas in the past, you want to assess your, your step width. And if it's narrow or crossover, you want to correct that. Lastly is the contralateral hip drop, referring to the hip of the swinging leg traveling down towards the ground. So you're sort of collapsing during your mid stance. When Chris Brammer observed injured runners and healthy runners, he discovered that for every one degree increase in your hip drop, raised the odds of this runner being classified as injured by 80%. But Brody, how can I tell if I have a hip drop and what can I do to improve it? On top of that, how can I correct all of these elements that you're suggesting? Well, this is where my two simple areas of focus come in. First, if present, is to correct that narrow or crossover step width. You can do this by just consciously taking slightly wider steps. The second is to increase your cadence if it is below optimal. Adjusting these two things will automatically correct any overstride, increase the activation of your hips and knees to reduce any hip drop, it will help keep your posture upright, and it will help reduce your ground reaction force. So focusing on and correcting these two elements, just automatically everything just falls into place. Finding your ideal cadence is the crucial piece of the puzzle. And I've created another video for you to learn exactly what cadence is and what cadence number you should strive for. So check out the video and run with confidence knowing your technique is on the right track.